Welcome everyone. Um, it's five past five on a Wednesday afternoon. My name is Shamit Sagar. Um, I am um, two things at UWA. First of all, I'm the director of the UWA Public Policy Institute. And I'm in addition to that, a professor of political science at our university. So it's a great, I, with great pleasure, I welcome you to this um, uh, early evening session dealing with the, um, the whys and wherefores of the three steps to an affordable zero waste mine. Quite a large mouthful there. Can I just say a couple of things before we um, get going into a very full program? The first is a word or two about the Policy Institute. Uh, the UWA Public Policy Institute was established uh, in 2018 and we've been going for a year or two now and it is very much part of the university's uh, original civic university mission in order to be here for the betterment, prosperity and well-being of the people of WA uh, as a whole. Uh, and our core purpose, of course, has to do with translating the research findings of our uh, world leading researchers right across all four faculties. Uh, secondly, also to put forward thought leadership in areas where um, either government or indeed uh, the academic community has uh, has been, as it were, shy in terms of thinking about the medium term and uh, medium and long term future. And then lastly, we also have a role in terms of working closely, connecting experts, improving, improving the capability and capacity of those experts to work alongside government business and non-profits. Uh, you can take a quick look at our work if you're not familiar with us uh, at our website. Can I also, before we go any further, as is customary at UWA, begin with the uh, Noongar acknowledgement. And that is to say, at UWA, we acknowledge that our Crawley campus is situated on Noongar land, and that the Noongar people remain the spiritual, cultural custodians of their land, and that they practice their values, languages, language, beliefs, and knowledge I, on behalf of the university, pay my respects to their leaders, past, present and future. So before we go any further, I'll just take a moment or two of your time to um, uh, not just uh, sort of shout out, uh, but I think we've got about 100 plus people who have registered and now, uh, in fact, participating in this event. But if I can just draw attention to a very new member of the UWA community as of this week, which, of course, is our uh, incoming vice chancellor, uh, you won't know that he's there. Uh, I understand that he's uh, part of this discussion, but I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Amit Chakma, who will be joining formally the university in his capacity as Vice Chancellor on the 6th of July. Uh, he's uh, travelled from Canada uh, via, I think, uh, the East Coast, uh, and he is, of course, uh, undergoing a, uh, a quarantine as a result. Uh, accepting the 1,452 people who are, in fact, his Twitter followers, you will not know that he describes himself as a, a global citizen, two, an educator, and three, a public policy enthusiast. So um, you're very welcome uh, as part of the UWA community uh, to be part of this conversation and, and, and it'd be part of a very long, uh, long collaboration, no doubt. Now, what can I say before we go any further? We've got a very significant um, cast. In a moment, I'll be hand, handing over to uh, Nicole uh, Rockay who will be moderating our event, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to sort of set out sort of two or three big broad brush issues, which I, I suspect may come up. The first is one of the reasons why we think the Zero Waste Mine event um, is a worthwhile endeavor for the Public Policy Institute is it brings together academic expertise on the one hand, industry and practitioners on the other, and lastly, government and policymakers uh, specifically. That's reflected in the panel who will be speaking in a moment. The second is there's a real emphasis in the work that uh, Talitha and others through the um, UWA Mine Initiative have put forward on not just the rehabilitation and remediation of uh, the waste that comes from the mining industry, but actually to try to get ahead of that and think a little bit about how the waste can be dealt with by design at the outset. In public policy, we would take call that a much more of a preventive, preventative approach. And thirdly and finally, I imagine uh, some of this will come up, which is to look at the economics and regulatory framework of how this might be achieved. And in particular, focus on two things. One is the efficient allocation of costs and investment decisions. Those can be made uh, clear for potential investors. And second of all, providing as much uh, clarity to the industry itself. Uh, and they would often describe this as being much more of an emphasis upon a rules based approach to regulation, real clarity about people's responsibilities and their obligations. Now, all these things are going to be uh, coming up, no doubt, to a greater or lesser extent in our discussion. But it seems to me this is an excellent area for the Public Policy Institute to be collaborating uh, 
uh, colleagues right across the university. Now, you haven't come along to hear me in any great detail. Let me now uh, hand over and introduce very briefly uh, Talitha Santini. Uh, Talitha is a senior lecturer in environmental science at UWA. She is the director of the Mining Innovation Network, a relatively new um, uh, creation from the university. Uh, a quick glance at their own website will tell you the extraordinary extent to which they are an interdisciplinary uh, group of researchers and, and, and heavily involved with practitioners. Uh, and lastly, I think you'll also see that she herself has had tremendous exposure and ex in and experience with industry itself. So she's a perfect collaborator and it's been a great pleasure to talk to her over many months in terms of developing this particular idea that she's run with. Uh, let me just hand over to Talitha at this moment. Thanks, Shamit. That was a wonderful introduction. So I'm going to start by giving a brief introduction to the Mining Innovation Network, which, uh, as Shamit mentioned, is a relatively uh, new uh, initiative from the university, bringing together all of our interdisciplinary expertise um, and really world class research across a range of different areas that are relevant to the mining industry. Um, while we're individually excellent in each of these disciplines, um, we're also uh, part of our strength is coming together as a team as well. And so the intent of this network is to provide an entry point uh, into all of the, that the university has to offer in this space. Um, what we're doing is coalescing our offerings uh, in mining relevant fields for training, research and technology development and community engagement as well. And I'm sure many people in the audience are already familiar with some of the initiatives uh, that are existing uh, in various disciplines, such as the Centre for Exploration Targeting, um, the Centre for Rock Art Research um, and the Australian Centre for Geomechanics. Um, and what we're aiming to do now is to build much larger uh, teams to tackle those really thorny, complex challenges that are increasingly the ones that the mining industry uh, is grappling with that really require that interdisciplinary approach to solve. Um, and doing that in partnership with government, with community groups, um, with non-government organisations and companies as well. Um, we have a few new training opportunities um, and avenues for reskilling and upskilling as well uh, through UWA Plus, which has recently launched, as well as Access UWA, which some of you may already be familiar with. Um, and so again, this uh, website uh, is now live, a uh, very basic page to start with, and this event is part of our soft launch for the Mining Innovation Network. So I'd encourage you to uh, visit the page and um, keep uh, coming back uh, to learn more about what the university has to offer and some of the new opportunities in this space. And so tonight's event is a really great place to start because when we talk about the potential for a zero waste mine, it really does require expertise from a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different stakeholders to solve. Um, if we think about the kinds of waste that are generated at a mine site, there are many. Um, we produce all different kinds of wastes across uh, the, the value chain and throughout the mine site. And indeed, these wastes can vary in both volume and type uh, over the life of mine as well, uh, not just where they're being produced within the, the mine site. Um, and as well as the activities that we typically think of as being part of the mining process, it's some of those ancillary activities that are important as well. So power generation being a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions and where uh, our operations are using coal uh, stations, obviously solid waste in the form of fly ash as well. Um, what we're going to focus on tonight is probably some of those larger volume uh, wastes uh, rather than some of the smaller volume wastes and the wastes that are really specific to the mining industry. So things like tailings um, and some of the wastewaters that are generated, waste rock, um, and obviously the, the intensity of energy use in the mining industry as well being major issues. If we have a look at some statistics um, from the most recent Mining Rehabilitation Fund report, we can start to put a, a size uh, on the scale of the problem of tailings and waste rock in Western Australia, although it's a very coarse scale estimate. Um, and so if we look at those numbers and make some assumptions uh, around average uh, characteristics of tailings and waste rock storage areas, we come out with the rather large figures of somewhere between three and 10 billion tonnes of tailings that are currently in storage in Western Australia and 17 to seven, uh, seven to 17 billion tonnes of waste rock. 
Now, these are huge volumes of material in storage that we're currently not uh, putting to any kind of productive use. Uh, there's a huge opportunity there if we can just come up with the strategies uh, and develop the markets to, to reuse these. In some other areas, we're doing a bit better. So water uh, is, an, is a part of the mining industry uh, that is quite uh, strongly affected. A lot of that is from uh, abstraction uh, to excavate uh, open cut pits that intersect with water tables. Um, and here around 40% uh, is returned to the environment or reused in other offsite applications, which is a fantastic outcome. Um, many of you may be familiar with uh, some of the work that's been happening in the Pilbara over recent years to develop pivot agriculture uh, up there, reusing uh, that water that has been abstracted through uh, mine site excavation activities. <laughs> When it comes to energy, uh, the, the industry as a whole is quite reliant at the moment on fossil fuels. Um, and this is particularly true when we look at uh, brownfields operations versus greenfields operations. And I think this will be a theme that comes up uh, in our panel discussion uh, tonight as well. Making some of these changes and progressing towards a zero waste mine is certainly a lot easier when you're starting from a greenfields operation than when you're trying to go back and retrofit into brownfield sites. Um, so what we're seeing across the industry as a whole over time is a trend towards the use of gas and renewables. But a lot of this is driven by some of these greenfield sites. We've seen huge investments um, in various different sites. Uh, so the Degrusa Solar Project, the Agnew uh, Gold site using wind and solar, um, and Rio Tinto's Kudai Dairy uh, mine using a solar plant uh, as well. Another theme that will come up tonight will be uh, the distinction between different kinds of avenues to pursue zero waste mining. Uh, so making a distinction between waste minimization, uh, so optimizing or changing processes so that less waste is produced, reusing waste either on-site or off-site. Um, and there's a big difference here in terms of uh, the kinds of levers and mechanisms that are required to drive these. Obviously, reusing on-site, the market is there already. Reusing off-site, you not only have to develop that market, but often uh, encounter more challenging regulatory frameworks and build community support uh, for those kinds of activities as well. Um, and what we want to do over time, of course, is move up this hierarchy uh, and eventually aim to have a zero waste uh, mine fully operational. So while we'll probably focus in on a couple of key wastes tonight, I'd encourage you all to think about how the different um, barriers and opportunities that we discuss uh, could be implemented in all of, in the management of all of these different wastes uh, over the, the life of mine and across the value uh, chain in mining uh, to achieve that goal of a zero waste mine. So without uh, further introduction from me, I'll now, now hand over to our moderator for tonight's panel discussion, Nicole Roeke. She is the Chief Executive Officer of the Minerals Research Institute of Western Australia. And Nicole, I will hand over to you from here. Thanks for that, Talitha. Unfortunately, I managed where to find my um, unmute button on uh, this um, on the platform. I think we're all learning how to quickly change from one platform to another uh, nowadays, but it's great uh, to be able to be here. And thank you everyone for joining us um, on a Wednesday evening at, at five o'clock. Um, it's a really interesting topic uh, that's been chosen for this afternoon's session. Um, and I think what certainly all of us who are involved and in preparing for the session, what we are keen to do is to understand where you've got questions and comments. Um, and so um, when you registered, I believe you were sent the login details um, or the, the site details for Slido. Um, and would encourage you throughout the course of the evening to be able to register your questions um, onto the Slido website. Um, the hashtag for that is hashtag zero waste mine once you are on the um, Slido website. And then what I'll try and do is not to get distracted by the conversation and just keep asking my questions, um, but we'll also seek to make sure that I get your questions um, out in the open as well. But to kick off, um, and as a, a way of um, introducing the panellists, um, what I might do is um, throw my um, my doorstop question to Mike Rowe in the first instance. Um, 
Mike is the Director General for the WA Department of Water and Im Environment Regulation. And Mike, for a moment, I'm just going to channel um, Daryl Kerrigan from the castle. And I'm going to ask you, is Talitha dreaming that she's that a zero waste mine is even possible? Well, thank you very much, Nicole. Good evening, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here uh, and um, and hello to everybody out there uh, that's that's participating this afternoon and this evening. Um, so a bit like Daryl Kerrigan, um, you, I thought you were going to try and sell me some Japanese clapping sticks for a minute, Nicole. That's <laughs> also a standout moment from that movie for me. But look, I think it's important to have a dream. Um, great things have been achieved uh, on this planet with people having big visions and bold visions and dreams. Um, I suspect that um, that Talitha's vision as she set out uh, is achievable. It's certainly very aspirational. Uh, and I think that we've got a long way to go before we can probably deliver that. Having said that, the mining industry is particularly innovative and the Western Australian mining industry, I think globally, is really innovative in that space. So um, there's all sorts of great things that are happening in that area. Um, we'll probably touch on a little bit later on some of the things that the Western Australian government is pursuing in a policy and regulatory space, which will hopefully enable um, all industry sectors in Western Australia to really try and embrace the circular economy uh, and, and reuse, uh, reduction of waste, reuse of materials and so on. So I'm keen to talk about that later on. Um, so look, they're, they're big challenges, they're complex operations, uh, plenty of opportunity. The other thing I'd like to explore a little bit later, perhaps in discussion, is uh, what the social licence for mining might mean into the future and what communities' expectations might be and how they might change in terms of um, expectations around mining companies' performance in issues like waste. Great. I'll remember to um, throw that one to you, Mike, a bit later. So our second panellist, um, that we have is Felicia Lee Keeley um, as Senior Research Scientist with our COA of Australia. And um, while I did look to find my best knitted um, jumper um, in the castle style, um, unfortunately they're, they're kind of all gone with the nice patterns on them. But Felicia, what are your views on whether Talitha's dreaming? Hi everybody, um, nice to talk to you guys all tonight. Um, uh, uh, I believe that that Talitha isn't really dreaming. Um, she she has some some um, great uh, aspirations there for sure, and uh, Alcoa has definitely has a stance there in terms of um, looking at the amount of material that we have in terms of um, what is stored in residue. Um, you would probably think that we have so much out there. Can we actually achieve um, the ability to reuse such material? And from the work that we've done um, over the last 15 years, it's showcased that there is great potential for us to utilise this and that dream could potentially be a reality um, and in significant quantities as well. Um, and um, when you take a look at some of the tailings areas and, and where we store um, and the amount of land that is used in these areas to think that we could potentially rehabilitate these areas, that we could use these for other um, uses and also find um, ways to reuse these materials in industries that may be lacking in supply in um, traditional materials that they might use. So I think um, it's great to have a dream, as Mike said as well, and um, we do need that aspiration within industry to have a goal and, and to set a, a high goal um, to, to work towards. So I'm looking forward to um, continuing this discussion with everybody and sharing the experiences that Alcoa has experienced, um, both um, barriers that we may have seen initially, um, but have now looked and, and um, produced an opportunity for us and a large opportunity for us to um, proceed with in terms of um, reusing um, materials from our mining industry. Great, thanks um, for that Felicia and um, our final panellist for this evening is Ian Rowans, um, Director of Great Southern Landscapes Greening Australia and Ian brings together an interesting skill set from ecological restoration um, and mining. Um, and Ian, you know what my doorstop question uh, to you is going to be? You've been given the heads up. Um, do we need to have Talitha committed to care? Nope. Oh, Ian, we don't seem to be able to hear you. Well, Nicole, you have sorted out your mute button and I have been the first to show you that I can't figure it out. So there <laughs> we go. <laughs> I 
Uh, thank you for that, Nicole, and, and thank you everyone for joining this evening. Um, I don't want to be um, maybe the 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 black sheep of the uh, of the um, sort of panel here, but potentially there is a, a few challenges worth exploring. And I think you know, notwithstanding the dreams and the aspirations of the industry. Um, and the other economic incentives that can be born from a circular economy and and a zero waste mine, um, there are some there are some pretty significant challenges um, that sort of sit within probably the economic uh, frameworks of how a mine is actually run, um, in particular brownfields operations, um, uh, long deep procurement uh, contracts, and and other complications around unwinding some of these uh, things to to unlock new opportunities. And also uh, the reuse of land. Um, you know the 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 way that the mining operation is classic classically looked at at land and looked at um, the extraction of the material. Um, it isn't a a core uh, sort of tenant of of their processes. And I think that is a realization that um, we all need to embrace um, because the challenge is how do we make that front and center, and or how do we make that opportunity. Um, real from from reuse of that waste, and I think so. I 100% agree we can get there, um, but not without a lot of coordinated effort through policy, uh, research, um, and communities as well. So I think, um, yeah, it'll take a multi-sectoral approach. Fantastic. Um, so uh, for everyone out there um, listening and and watching the panel session, the You've heard the opening statements um, from the respective panellists. Um, we know Talitha's view because she's organised the session and um, she's keen to, to see this conversation. So to just remind you, can I please ask for any questions? Otherwise, you're just going to hear me ask questions. Um, use Slido hashtag zero waste mind so that I can um, draw your questions into this conversation to make sure um, we don't let these three panellists and Talitha off the hook this evening. Um, this is about challenging the conversation and not being agreeable. Um, and so thank you, Ian, for starting to be a bit more disagreeable um, in terms of what, what the challenges are. So Felicia, you, um, you started to talk to and acknowledged that our COA have been on a 15 year journey um, in this conversation around waste, reuse, minimisation, repurposing, re-something, re-wasting. Um, would be interested to have you just talk through what have been, I guess, some of the key learnings um, with uh, that you've seen in our COA over that 15 years. What are kind of, what's the value of hindsight um, that we should be thinking about so that we don't underestimate what the barriers and challenges might be, and and what do you think you might have done differently? For sure, thanks Nicole. Um, just to give everybody a bit of background if you're not aware of our coal operations and, and what what we do, um, we, um, uh, we have three refineries based in Western Australia. Um, we produce alumina from bauxite that then gets smelted into aluminium. Um, I'll focus most of the, the discussion around Western Australia, although we do have six active re refineries across the globe. Um, the bauxite deposits here in Western Australia have significant quantities of a coarse material, um, which is mainly predominantly made out of quartz. Um, so it's almost like virgin sand material um, that gets processed through our, our refining operations, and that contributes to about 50% of our tailings, um, this coarse material. Um, we uh, we call this material red sand, so I'll reference this um, as I discuss the journey that we've had over the last 15 years. Um, but to give you an idea of the type of quantities that are generated in our industry, just to give you an idea of scale, um, in Western Australia, we produce about 9.6 million tonnes per annum of alumina, but from that, we have about 18.5 um, million tonnes of residue that's generated out of that uh, on an annual basis. So it's it's quite significant how much is to, um, compared to how much we are um, producing, our core um, product that we're producing. Um, so around 9 million tonnes of that is the sand material that could potentially be reused. So it's significant volumes that are uh, um, capable to be um, utilised. 
Um, in terms of the journey that we've taken, uh, my role at Alcoa is in the R&D department. I run projects looking at production improvements, um, both in the continuous improvement areas to develop technologies that help um, drive returns, but we're also looking at advancing sustainability at the same time. Um, Often in the mining industry, it's a very linear approach um, um, where we where we mine, um, we make, and then we waste. Um, but Alcoa has um, a, a very good st strategic um, sustainability pro um, profile that is looking at a number of different areas, and one of them is in the reuse side. Um, Talitha talked earlier about um, um, reuse externally and internally. Um, I'm focusing mainly on the external side here, but internally um, we, we definitely do reuse materials such as waste oils for dust suppression and water reuse for dust suppression as well. Um, and also looking at waste min minimization within um, our plants, um, including um, recycling um, scraps. So we have a worm farm that, that looks after that. So um, in terms of aspects of uh, Alcoa as a whole, there we, we do look at different initiatives within that framework of um, waste that Talitha mentioned earlier. Um, but in terms of the journey that we, we've had over the 15 years, um, it started as a technical project, so um, uh, focused on R&D on how we might be able to transform something that um, traditionally is considered um, a waste and trying to change that thinking that there's actual value associated with that. So tr it's um, not only changing the material, but also changing um, um, social, um, I guess, um, understanding on what waste actually is. And I guess I could pose a question to everybody who's listening out there um, and have a think about this when I talk about um, 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 what we've done with red sand is would you um, use a material that has gone through a industrial process to build your house? Would you use a material that has gone through industrial process to um, in your garden to grow vegetables or to um, to fill um, backfill. Um, have a think about that, and, and that, that gives you an indication of what the challenge actually is, because there's a, a huge barrier on on that perception side, as well as um, getting the technology out there to actually transform materials that can be reused. Um, so. Um, with Red Sand, I, I guess I'll highlight um, some of the challenges that we've had and then in hindsight, some maybe a couple of things that um, I'd like to share with you in, if you're looking at reusing byproduct materials in your industry or if you're looking at doing a research project. Um, one of the key ones that um, internally that we had that we um, had issues with was defining a business case. So getting that initial investment to take that project um, forward, um, being able to define what our liabilities are if we don't use this material for reuse, um, and also instead of in in the in the more um, traditional sense, we would we would um, frame the business case along the lines of uh, capital deference um, or. Um, also licensed to operate in case in, in the event that there may be um, a, a release of material through our tailings um, um, storage areas. And then the other internal um, barrier that we faced was trying to um, get an understanding on what the risks and liabilities are, um, both on a legal standpoint and also on a use standpoint. So having um, developed a clear risk assessment um, criteria and framework around how internally we were going to be able to assess materials and then uh, potentially transfer that framework that we've devised out um, to um, other industries. And that's the work that we've been um, doing with Nicole um, in terms of the MIRA project. We've had projects um, working um, with other CRCs um, to look at how we might be able to um, define better how to utilise waste and to understand what the sustainability credentials are and also what risk assessments frameworks we need in place on the regulatory side as well. So in terms of externally, um, um, we face a lot of barriers around the regulation. So um, we, we we need to have a clear, firstly, a clear criteria on what is classified as a waste. So um, if we know exactly what those that criteria is, it makes it easier for industries to understand um, how to classify their byproduct materials and what they can actually um, transform for reuse. And then secondly, it's to, um, to really define the market 
um, and getting that market ex acceptance. Um, it's a bit of a chicken and the egg. You're not going to invest in something that that your customers aren't going to use. Um, or the, the industry that, that mainly uses that material um, won't, won't take on. So in terms of just th three opportunities um, to finish off with, um, I'd like to highlight in hindsight is, um, is really to try and create the market early. So engage with stakeholders at the very initial onset of your project. Um, when you do trials and demonstrations with the material to engage the stakeholders very early. Um, we have seen that supply chain has, has um, and procurement has changed recently in that they are looking for more sustainable products to be used in their tender processes. So um, we've actually seen a pull for our material rather than a push. And this is a, a great to see that this is starting to shift. And that is, is how um, our interaction with various stakeholders have created that market and that, that created that awareness as well. Um, and also um, being able to create value um, in, in that product to actually define what value that we have in, in reusing our materials, both um, that it has sustainability credentials when you utilise our material as opposed to other virgin sand materials. So it's a lot of mouthful, I'm sorry that I covered quite a lot in a short period of time. Um, um, it has been a difficult journey, but one that we have learned quite considerably um, from, and it will only just make us um, want to pursue other byproduct materials. Um, we'll, we'll be able to do that in a much quicker fashion. Um, and now it's, it's really engaging with um, other industries in how we might be able to support that forward for them. Great. Um, thanks for that, Felicia. That was certainly a really comprehensive answer and you've kind of covered off on a whole um, other sequel questions that I had um, there for you. But you've also given me a segue um, to Mike and um, it's a question that's been asked on Slido as well. So my instructions tell me I'm meant to facilitate the conversation and then do the question and answers, but I'm going to blend them all into in together. So Mike, um, you know, it's always the legislation um, and the approvals process that's <coughs> at the fault of industry developing it's where it wants to go. Is is this true? Like, are there legal hurdles? Are there hurdles in the legislation that's actually impediments? And, and what's the opportunity there? Uh, yeah, very good question, Nicole. Um, firstly, I guess um, I'd say legislation can be an enabler more than a barrier, and that's where we want it to be. And I'll, I'll tell that story in a minute with specifically to waste. But um, we've already heard from, from Felicia that, in fact, some of the other barriers are about markets and the propensity and also the community acceptance of, of, of waste derived materials and other things. So um, I would never say that legislation alone is a barrier to achieving good things, of course, and you probably expect me to say that. But let's understand the situation in Western Australia when it comes to waste reuse. So um, uh, we do have a challenge in our regulatory environment in Western Australia, and I saw that slide question as well. And that because that came about because of a legal um, a court case some time ago that re kind of redefined our understanding of, of waste in Western Australia and how it was defined in a legal sense. Um, the predecessor agencies to to my department, the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation, have been moving down the path of a kind of a waste derived materials framework that it will allow for case by case approvals of, of waste derived materials in a sensible and risk based way. And, and I'll say at the outset, that's absolutely what we want to do. We want to be enabling a society and an economy where the, where the circular economy is fully enabled. So and that applies to all industry sectors, household um, construction, mining, whichever way you look at it. We, we, it's in our best interest as citizens of this planet to be really trying to support circular economy thinking as best we can. Um, so with that high kind of philosophical piece, then back to the challenge. So, um, so, that, so the legal challenge effectively uh, put into question what we understood to be the definition of waste. Um, and the only solution to that, unfortunately, is to actually um, is to do a comprehensive kind of legal overhaul. So uh, what we've already been doing through the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation is consulting um, with stakeholders uh, around what, what a new framework for waste derived materials could look like and how they and how that might apply. And we released an issues paper last year called Waste Not Want Not Valuing Waste as a Resource. And that was putting the issues out on the table quite transparently, um, I guess explaining the legal conundrum that we're in, but also putting forward some possible solutions, often modeled in, in on what happens in other jurisdictions, which is that 
Um, depending on the nature of the waste materials that you've, you've got, then, then you would come to the regulator on a case-by-case -case basis uh, for an approval that would enable you to, to use those waste materials for other purposes. At the moment, um, some of that legal certainty is not there sufficiently for industry at least to act on the basis that they that they that their interests would be protected, or at least that, that that's the perception that they operate in. So, the government has committed to have this conversation about what might happen differently into the future, and following up in the next few months, we'll come out with a more detailed proposal around how that could work. So, um, this government, I should say, has a very strong commitment to waste. Minister Dawson um, has waste uh, generally as one of his top priorities. Um, you might be aware of of the the waste authority, and it's a quick plug for the waste authority, which and the waste. Uh, strategy for Western Australia. So I know that the chairman of the Waste Authority, Reg Howard Smith, is out there in the audience somewhere. Good evening, Reg, who coincidentally happens to know a lot about the mining industry. So I think it's, a, it's great that he's listening out there, and I hope I don't get it wrong. Um, but the Waste Authority plays a very important role in advising the state government on waste policy more generally. Um, my department's role is to support the Waste Authority in that work, but also to, to do much of the, the policy action and, and the regulatory stuff that needs to follow uh, to really try and to get to Western Australia to be uh, a much more um, you know, contemporary, progressive uh, jurisdiction in relation to thinking about waste and how we manage it. So um, yes, we do have a challenge in relation to end of waste. Uh, we realise that's a challenge. We are looking at ways of how we can do that because we do want to enable um, appropriate risk-based reuse of waste materials from mining or from all sorts of other sources. Now, um, Felicia's story is a long and winding one, and I really do, do feel for her. Um, uh, but but in, in a happy sort of circumstance, Alcoa uh, have now got to the place where they are actively looking for markets for red sand and, and using it really innovatively. And there are a few other examples for, for mining byproducts that we are starting to see emerge as well. And that's despite the absence of this concrete legal framework that we know that we need. So, so there are good examples of where things are happening. If I think about other parts of the um, other industries, certainly um, the, our, our transport colleagues are increasingly using waste derived materials as part of their construction effort. And given all of the massive amounts of um, you know, infrastructure development we're going to have um, in Western Australia as a result of you know, uh, infrastructure investment being brought forward by state and Commonwealth governments in the, in the face of the pandemic, um, clearly uh, there, there is plenty of happy opportunity, I think, for waste derived materials to be increasingly used in road construction and other forms of, of infrastructure development. So um, yes, we do have a challenge, but we're aware of it uh, and we're doing something about it in a policy sense. And, and hopefully um, the government will, will have to decide uh, you know, uh, how they want to take that legislation forward into the future. Um, but, but it is absolutely something that we're very mindful of. So we're looking forward to being able to, to provide the, the appropriate regulatory and policy framework to really enable that kind of innovation to flourish. And I, there are other examples where we see that innovation in Western Australia as well, uh, in a kind of an industrial ecology sense. So many of the audience would be familiar with Quinana, great examples of some one company's waste product being another company's input. So that's the kind of economy and society that we need to be imagining into the future. Thanks for that, Mike. And I might just um, quickly throw back to Felicia just for a quick answer. So Mike talked to um, use of waste in um, infrastructure projects and we've had a question on Slido just asking, is red sand not able to be used as road base? Oh, yeah, um, it definitely is able to be used as road base. We actually have a demonstration project that has been completed on Greenlands Road. Um, it was used as sub base there and that's been um, running for quite some time now. Um, so if you ever drive towards in that, that region, you can actually drive across a road that has actually used red sand as road base. Um, interesting that the, the question was asked. Um, just before this call, um, um, I was on a call with um, a company that is tendering for the Bunbury Outer Ring um, Road project um, with the potential to use um, um, our material also in road construction, um, not only just as a sub base, but um, also to be used as um, um, binder for, for road construction. So there are a number of different avenues that, that red sand can be utilised in the road construction um, 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 place. So um, yes, definitely. And if you like more information, it's actually publicly available. Um, um, so if you do a search for red sand and road base, you'll probably find um, some information there. Great. Um, thanks for that. And I guess that's uh, another question that's come up on Slido is around um, 
what's the government and um, water and environment regulation more specifically doing um, looking at um, making sure re re reuse of waste is at the forefront of future opportunities. And I think one key way that um, Felicia's just flagged is that government through its purchasing power um, is able to stimulate a conversation and, and drive um, companies and drive markets. We, we've talked on markets, but I, I might loop back through that. But Ian, um, uh, you've had a nice um, relaxing time so far. Um, and just to uh, draw you into the conversation, keen for your views on whether you actually think there's a common understanding of what a circular economy is, um, of what zero waste mining actually means, and do you think we've got the solutions to be able to achieve it? Yeah, good good questions. I think um, I think we're probably still investigating what those terms mean and um, probably still evolving in regards to what an end state looks like. I know there are some companies out there who are um, very much in the green fields sort of perspectives. You know, their, their whole company model is looking at um, reuse of tailings, for example, as as the way that they are going to extract value as a business. So, um, you know, there, there, there are some uh, some happening in that space, but I think at the same time, we're, we're trying to still grapple with how does this work for a large brownfield site that has um, quite a lot of uh, complexity to them. Um, you know, you know, I think we've talked a bit about um, some of the, the major uh, waste streams that exist, obviously energy emissions, the tailings sort of purpose, um, you know, obviously big scenarios, but there's a range of other waste streams that sort of are generated off of a mine site that I, when you look at them in isolation, the business cases to make actions are, are very challenging. Um, you know, uh, generally, uh, you know, mining is, is focusing on on extraction of products. And I think the, um, the, the way that we need to start looking um, at those business cases is quite critical. So most of the time, if take, for example, um, forest clearing material, Can you, can, oh, can you hear me? I can now. I think we all got put on to mute. So either someone's um, really unhappy with what <laughs> we're all talking about. Um, <laughs> back to you. Oh, all right. So not sure how much you heard there, but I, I just sort of touching on the, the fact that if we, I took for an example, you know, waste debris from forest clearing. Most of the time that is, you know, bundled up and burnt. Um, you know, if, if, trying to solve that issue within the within the scheduling processes and um, you know cost constrained sort of uh, environments, that that doesn't really stack up. And and most of the things that you may be trying to do with that, maybe you're trying to resell that material onto a, a small local group who would reuse it for topsoil in in or you know or or repurpose that for some reasons. Um, a lot of those benefits are still just positive externalities, and they're not really. Um, captured in the value case that's been brought back to the business. So I, I think a lot for me is how do we leverage um, yeah, leverage those sort of cases to really solve business pressured problems. So take the forest clearing material, for example. Um, you know, how can you take that um, and repurpose that into a position where you're utilizing that for topsoil creation to help with your biodiversity offset? Um, and at the same time, you know, if you're doing restoration activities, how is that restoration activity at the same time giving you a carbon offset? Um, those sort of, uh, you know, dual purpose, uh, multi-layered uh, business cases have to be brought to the surface here because on their own, waste can be enormously capital intensive process, depending on, you know, the size and scale of what you're looking at um, and can be really unattractive for a lot of reasons. And I think um, when you talk about circular economy, it's also about, um, you know, a, re a recognition of a, a economy that's that's looking outside of our um, sort of sector. So the, the the mine industry, my example, is a lot of trouble from an industry perspective, opening the doors and saying, hey, what is the actual pinch point for the forestry industry? What, what's happening in, in forestry right now? Um, you know, with bushfires in the in the East Coast, for example, obviously we want to badly hit on the West, but how, what are the pinch points in their supply chains? What's happening there that that could be uh, connected for a waste purpose for from, from mining. So I think that's a, 
um, a, a pretty big important piece for me that uh, to get to get there, um, you know, we've really got to step outside of what we know. Um, you know, the, the world is a, a rectangle, um, you know, in mining sort of senses, we're looking to, to, to achieve an outcome. Um, a lot of the times that there's, there could be a sector right to the right, which has a, a de absolute uh, demand for a product that we um, we can supply them with. So, yeah, I think um, business cases to me are quite a quite an important um, aspect to consider to reach that circular economy or zero waste mining, Nicole. Right. So, so you know, I might keep you on that vein a little bit, and um, just we've we've had a question come in, which is looking at the economic feasibility. And I mean, I think. Um, we throw enough money at something and can give it enough time, then if anything's possible. Um, that's a great thing about research. Um, and, you know, Talitha all put forward an argument as to why we should all be investing um, in research in this this area as soon as I give her the airwaves. But it is, is everything really economically feasible? And the example that's been given um, about, you know, hauling waste from the Pilbara into urban areas to reuse in, in markets such as Perth or the East Coast or, or Southeast Asia? Or, or is there a conversation that needs to be had in the industry in terms of how, um, how the mine closure and liabilities associated with that are treated on company balance sheets. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I think Felicia mentioned it as well. You know, understanding those liabilities is the first step. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of work that goes into that even before a mine is developed. Um, there's a lot of work in understanding what that that um, that liability looks like. But currently, one of the biggest barriers I would I, I, I think for both brownfields, greenfields and closed sites is the recognition or relinquishment of areas that are being repurposed or being reutilized um, to be drawn off of um, or, or the, the liability, for example, being reduced or, um, you know, using some some very it's, that's the carrot or the stick sort of approach, right? In, in I saw another question in there around how do you how can you promote that um, looking at shipping waste from the Pilbara down to Perth or repurposing a tailings facility into a, you know, solar thermal, you know, energy producing area. Um, you know, companies currently are sort of in the middle, I think, between, you know, the conversation needs to be had around how, how we're holding $500 million liability for this sort of product or whatever the number is. Most of the time, they're much larger than that over much longer time frames. Um, there's a there's a bit of a challenge in there around how to get uh, work between governments and industry to to really recognize um, you know is that a waste anymore if I have taken a tailings facility that is completely full of inert material um, am I best to try to rehabilitate that um, for for you know an ecosystem or is it actually better to put a energy plant on top of it um, but for the mining company to do that um, you know the the really big carrot there is well. Can I can I get rid of that liability? Is the liability reduced because it's an it's an asset producing value instead of something that's sitting there, um, you know, potentially causing damage in the future? And I guess that that that's a really interesting conversation. I think for both active mines and closed mines. Um, Felicia, in in terms of looking at um, companies escalating their um, consideration of and of how they treat liabilities um, that are associated with mine closure and certainly in and around waste, um, you know we've seen globally some um, catastrophic disasters um, with tailing dam failures. Um, and interested in your views on whether you feel that's actually driven a shift um, in companies in terms of their preparedness and propensity to want to um, look at solutions that maybe they wouldn't have done before because they now um, recognise the liability and the risk associated with that waste. Sure, Nicole. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I have seen um, on, a, on my personal level, I've seen a shift in 
um, our, our industry um, changing um, in being prepared for um, potential, um, I guess, uh, failures that have been seen across the globe. In our industry, the Samarco incident and also El Norte incident most recently has given us an idea of what the costs are associated with um, of, of these events. Um, with with El Norte cutting production by 50%, um, having cut production for over a year in, in that case, um, that's significantly obviously reduce their profit margin um, a lot. So I think having those cases um, unfortunately happen, but it all, it's also highlighted to our industry what needs to change. Um, we have um, in our industry, in the Nalcoa, um, uh, right now implemented um, a different way to store residue. So we are looking at ways not just to reuse residue, but how do we reduce the volume that um, is required for storage. Um, this is the residue filtration project that's been implemented at Quanana and um, also at Pinjara now. Um, so being able to reduce the volume and extend the life um, of our tailings area um, is also being being considered in that approach. Um, but yeah, to, I, I do agree that, the, that there's been a shift in um, us trying to frame what or future proofing um, our sites uh, for curtailment and also potential closure in the future. There's not only the solid um, tailings that we need to manage in, um, uh, we also have a lot of water um, that we need to manage as well. And and that liability is is ongoing for 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 pretty, pretty much infinite the, of the, the life of that mine. So um, that needs to be considered as well when when we're innovating um, right at the get go. To, to be thinking about that when we are developing solutions, um, not just trying to develop a solution to fix the problem um, in the short term, but to develop solutions that are thinking about the future, um, particularly in R&D, where we sometimes may be a little bit short-sighted in, in the research that we do um, to try and solve that problem quickly, um, but to have a think about what impact that's going to have in the long run. Um, so I think that's starting to change in our industry and people are, are looking in, in, in that area much more closely now and doing those assessments. And we've certainly all had the challenge of trying to argue for money in budgets for things that have more of a medium um, term time horizon uh, on them rather than that much more tangible um, short term time horizon. Um, Talitha, to um, throw a question to you, and um, as one of your slides, you talked about um, uh, reuse of waste, um, repurposing of waste, um, and waste minimisation. And we've had a question come through, which is looking at is um, reuse or minimisation the most powerful Step, what, what is the most powerful step towards reducing mine waste? Or, or is it a chicken and an egg? Is there a sequence of events? How, how do you um, see if, if we had a, a, how would you approach that? I think it's an interestingly, it's an interesting question. It's, uh, it's an interesting way of phrasing it. I mean, I think the most important, the most powerful step is the first step is just setting out that intention to embark on reducing and reusing waste that are being produced. Um, I completely agree with what Felicia was just saying about sometimes in the technical research and development, we can be a little short-sighted. And so we only develop one of those options when in fact we could be developing multiple different pathways. Um, so not only could we be you know, changing processes so that we're reducing the amount of waste that we produce or changing the properties of that waste so that it's more amenable to various reuse options, but we can also start doing the work of developing markets, developing different avenues, both on-site and off-site, for waste reuse. So I don't think it's a chicken or the egg. Um, I think it's just taking that first step. Um, and a really important part of that is engaging more different stakeholders earlier in that technical research and development process. I think that's part of the reason some of these great ideas never really come to fruition, never really get implemented at full site scale, is because there's some other challenge, not technical, uh, along the way. So it might be how it interfaces with legislation. It might be um, communities just don't like it. They don't trust the technology. We didn't engage them early enough in the process. Um, you know, you lose your social license to implement that. Um, there can be a range of different issues. And so 
this is part of the power of having a panel like this, right? Is having people who have deep technical knowledge, who have deep regulatory knowledge, who represent um, corporate, government, non-government industry partners, community groups as well, being part of that conversation as early as possible around which different options a site is going to invest in developing further. Um, Malika, while you're distracted, I'll throw you a quick question. Um, with Talitha's used the term again, social license, um, mm -hmm. and and uh, interested to understand where you see um, government policy or where you see there's opportunity um, to drive a conversation on social license, or whether given mining companies um, are commercial beasts. Um, who have shareholders that they have to deliver returns to, whether ultimately um, it all comes down to what the economics are. And, and another question that's come up on Slido is, is pointing to that WA mining companies won't even invest on pit backfilling when it happens in other places around the world. So, you know, are, are we dreaming to go back to the um, my channeling Daryl Kerrigan again? Are we dreaming that actually this is going to happen without regulatory intervention? Look, I think uh, social license is a really interesting um, concept and it's got a very strong intersection with public policy and regulation. You could argue in many ways that the laws of the land of a particular jurisdiction, in essence, end up reflecting the social license of a society or a company or an individual to operate because ultimately, and eventually in many cases, the parliament ends up reflecting the views of the, the polity of the people who elect us, so who, who elect the government of the day, I should say. Um, so I guess um, having worked for the government uh, in the public sector for some time, it's always interesting to me how or well, the extent to which government policy reflects emerging community debates and issues. And sometimes, um, particularly when things rely on legislation, often the legislation um, can be, you know, a, a long time behind where contemporary thought might be. And that's sheerly, you know, to, to, to do with the, the sheer uh, breadth of things that governments, you know, establish laws for across a whole range of the ways that society operates. Um, and sometimes you will see a flaring up of a particular issue and governments will respond quite quickly. In other cases, society on balance seems to be reasonably satisfied with a certain aspect of how they're being governed. And so things can go on for many, many years without a lot of kind of, um, you know, modification or whatever. In my case, one of the pieces of legislation that we administer is the Rights in Water and Irrigation Act 1914. So that piece of legislation has been around for over 100 years. It's been amended over time. But that would suggest, in fact, that the fundamental underpinnings of that legislation have served us quite well. And so, you know, and, and it's still one of the primary acts that we administer. Um, so, so I guess I, I'm always interested in what I hear, you know, um, uh, as, as what um, companies are facing in terms of their uh, exposure. I'm really fascinated to see the way that, that shareholders are, are kind of influencing the way companies behave, particularly when it comes to a whole range of issues around, say, greenhouse gas emissions or climate change. And so my, my strong sense is that increasingly um, industry is responsive to, to what society is telling them is important. Um, in the waste space, my, um, I guess, uninformed opinion in this would be that, relatively speaking, mining companies uh, and um, it's fantastic to hear what Elco is doing in terms of the diversity of, of, of approaches that, that are taken there. But if we say compare it to some other industry sectors, um, I think there is more work to be done in, in, in rethinking the possibilities of what a circular economy means. And I really do like what both Ian and Felicia and, and Talitha were saying in a sense, it's almost right actually, um, what, what, which is about the, the kind of the opportunities for mining companies, particularly at the start of new mines, to be thinking broadly about what is this going to? What is this asset going to deliver over many, many years? In some cases, if it's a greenfield site, it's often this this asset is going to be there for a long time. So, so imagining the possibilities of what might be possible in terms of either you know reuse of materials or reducing waste in the first instance from the very get go seems like a you know to to a, to a to an uninformed bureaucrat at least and and a person who's never worked for the private sector would seem in principle to be a good idea to be thinking through well what is the long term going to mean to this asset 
um, how might society's and government's expectations change over time, particularly when it comes to things like liabilities, which we've sort of touched on. So um, yes, the, the question uh, is right. I'm not going to have a go at answering why we don't necessarily require pit backfilling here, partly because that's not my policy area. That's that's governed by departments of mine industry regulations and safety, and I don't want to speak on behalf of them. So you, you can see that as a as a classic um, hand pass, but in all fairness, it's not something that I, that I feel able to comment on well. But, but so I, I'm really fascinated by the social license thing. Um, as we all know, um, communities' expectations can change quite rapidly about once was what we, what is widely accepted as being reasonable is no longer accepted as being reasonable. Um, sometimes the regulation takes time to catch up with that, and that's often because our legislation takes a long time to amend. Um, like, for example, right now the, the, the WA Parliament is considering amendments to the Environmental Protection Act. Um, this is being thought about in, in my department and its predecessor cases. For the last 15 years, we've been keen to get amendments to that legislation. And finally, we, we're getting some really um, important changes through. So, so um, you know, I'm assuming that mining companies take social licence very seriously because often they know that their reputation can, um, can shift much more quickly than a regulatory setting can. And, and I, I'm increasingly, I see mining companies take that stuff very seriously. So, to me, I think that's part of, of a positive step towards this, you know, Talitha's dream here. That in fact, you, if you do have responsive companies that take their social license very seriously, then they will be looking at signals. And one of the signals coming from the broader society across the planet is the importance of circular economy. And in many cases, as Ian points out, it just makes good economic sense. Yes, there are many challenges as the questions are put out on the Slido screen there, that the cost associated with transform, you know, transmitting uh, or transporting waste across the state the size of Western Europe, probably pretty sub-economic in many cases. But the opportunities for reuse, uh, on-site water reuse is a really good example. There are plenty of, plenty of great things that companies can do. Um, and again, in my own informed opinion, thinking early about what those opportunities might be and in the long term, um, thinking creatively and innovatively across multiple sectors might yield all sorts of opportunities. Thanks for that, Mike, and I'm sure I've still got lots of questions to ask, but I'm sure I'll get start getting the wrap up from someone soon. But um, I, I think uh, the questions being put up around can it, what can investors be doing? Um, and I think when you uh, look at the purchasing power of investors, um, that they are certainly can play a, a key role to influence the direction, particularly, um, well, not just in particularly, but also, but in mine sites where there's more greenfields mine sites to be able to be driving, uh, using their investment dollars to be able to um, drive a mining companies to think about their mine planning differently um, and to, to do uh, address social license to operate up earlier. So I think that's uh, that's something that's eminently feasible. Um, I'm going to do two, I want two quick answers. One, I'm going to flick one to Mike and one to Ian. Um, Ian, you made mention, you used the term brownfield site and we've had a question about what kinds of solutions, what should companies be doing um, where they where the the end of life is nigh, you know, for the mine, where where it's a brownfield site, there's a whole history um, there of possibly bad practices or practices that were appropriate of the day, but but expectations um, and standards have changed. What what can those sites do? Uh, the quick answer, I, I think, is um, we're looking at uh, the, the availability and constraints of their land that they have and looking at the repurpose of that land to uh, future generating assets. I think um, the mining uh, sector, you know, looking at what Felicia's looking at is, it, she, you know, Alcoa is expanding its potentially product base um, to think about all the waste it's using as now something that could be um, selling. Um, you know, maybe our perspective needs to change on what the end of mine life means. Um, conceptually, you know, does it actually have to stop once? Does it does does an operator actually have to stop leasing or owning that land even after you know a, a return from the product that they historically you know took from that land is is been you know extinguished? Um, take uh, you know. Um, water or hydro, you know, from pits that haven't been backfilled. Look at solar, look at wind. There's a range of energy solutions and renewable energy solutions that we can look at um, 
on repurposing land that are probably potentially more economic than um, flogging a dead horse and trying to actually create a, a forest ecosystem in a lot of these places, which are actually quite terribly degraded and will never get actually a, a recreational or environmental or a social value back into these landscapes. Um, we really need to be looking at repurpose. And Mike, the other piece of legislation you have the pleasure of looking after um, is contaminated sites legislation mm -hmm. as well. And so um, how, how do we have this conversation in relation to a mine site, um, which is also considered a contaminated site and um, which might well, the, the example that was given um, was around lead. Um, so so how, how do we have this zero waste mining conversation when the commodity itself um, brings its own challenges? Um, I think with a fair degree of realism is how we have the conversation because there are there are plenty of mine sites across WA that are you know heavily contaminated with the products. There's no um, despite and, and and hopefully into the future the science will bear this out and, and maybe they'll become viable as as repurposing or something. But at the moment, um, you know I guess we have to be realistic about what's achievable. Um, and so, and they're, they're often, a, you know, legacy mine sites that we're dealing with there in those situations that the cost, the scale is um, pretty significant in many cases. Um, realistically, the best you could probably hope for is making them as safe as possible and, and ensuring that they don't further harm the environment. That's not to say that we shouldn't be researching and thinking about what alternative uses you might be able to find into the future, as Ian's pointing out, or whether or not indeed what was considered a contaminant today might become a useful, you know, byproduct or input to something else. And there, there are examples, as I said before, where, where one company's waste is another person's input. So, I, you know, I don't want to be um, uh, uh, too unrealistic about it, but but the reality is that we've got a lot of contaminated sites around um, WA. Not all of them are mine sites, but but many of them are due to the nature of their the tailings material in particular. So it's a we just need to be realistic about that. Accept that there's a legacy there. Um, look out for what we might be possible into the future, and try and do better for for new for new sites and new developments that come along. Great. So I, I'm, I've run over time with my time that I was allocated, um, but I'm going to uh, the, the title of this this evening session was three steps to an affordable zero waste mine. So I'm going to give each of the panelists um, the if they were um, in charge of the world for the day, um, what would be their one single step? Um, that they would make happen um, to be able to um, uh, en enable us to have an affordable zero waste mine. So I'll maybe go Ian, Mike, Felicia, and then Talitha, I'll hand back over to you for some closing comments about what next. Uh, one, one step, I would just put it out as um, yeah, repurposing uh, existing land um, into value creating Assets. Over to you, Mike. <laughs> OK, thank you. So so mine would be, um, and it's an invitation really to this audience to stay engaged with the policy and regulatory development process going forward for our new waste derived material policy and hopefully new legislation into the future that will help us, um, you know, have a, have a much better risk based and case by case approvals um, to really support and encourage the wise reuse of waste derived materials from the mining sector. So look out for that and help us design uh, a great policy and regulatory framework for that so that we can make it happen. Yeah, and for me, one step is no matter where you are in your industry or what institution or company you are, to just have a think about where you might be able to reuse materials and roadmap that pathway. Um, no matter where you are in your business, there is potential for you to make a difference there. So um, have a look at it, it, what is around you and um, roadmap that pathway forward. And mine would be very similar to Felicia's, but as part of that process, really try and engage with a diversity of stakeholders early in thinking about potential pathways for reuse of those wastes as well. Excellent. Well, thanks um, for that, Talisha. And apologies to those who um, didn't able, well, I didn't get round to asking the questions. I tried to weave most of them uh, into the conversation, but there's a, a few up there. And 
um, in planning this session with the, uh, Talitha and the team was very much about wanting this to be the start of a conversation. Um, Mike has pointed to where there is opportunity and where the government is seeking uh, input from a broad array of stakeholders and will be consulting over the next um, six months or so um, in areas that are um, pertinent to this topic. But Talitha, what are your thoughts in terms of how to keep this conversation live and, and how do we um, go away from here and have a nice glass of red wine because we're not quite yet into dryish July? <laughs> Um, what, what do we need to do to be able to keep this all um, happening and going forward? Yeah, I, I think thought, we need Lisa, I thought um, Felicia had a glass of wine ready there to have <laughs> water. That's OK. Um, I think we need to keep the conversations going. So as you can see from the diversity of topics we've discussed tonight and the rich conversation we've had, there's so much here that we can and should be doing better. Um, and a lot of it really requires engagement from all different um, uh, all different stakeholders um, related to this sector. So what we'd love to see from here um, is the start of uh, a few more workshops and development of um, research and training agendas in this space uh, that will link into some of those great changes that we're going to see coming forward in the legislation as well, which will enable implementation um, of some of those ideas that people might have had about how to improve waste management, how to increase minimisation, how to increase reuse both on and off site uh, in their roles. So what we'll do after the event is um, send some emails out to all of our registered attendees and certainly you're welcome to circulate these within your own organisations and beyond as well um, and join us as part of that journey. Fantastic. And um, if I hand back to Shamit for some closing comments, and I think um, then I can say I've almost delivered my moderating exactly on time. Thank, thank you very much, Nicole. Um, you got to land it on the deck exactly as you're supposed to. Thank you for that. Um, look, can I just say there's a couple of minutes to remain. Um, a couple of things. Um, th this discussion in the end sort of got down to this question of, you know, kind of chicken and egg. What comes first? Do government sort of produce what? The public want or is it the other way around and I guess we, there's a kind of as Talitha said the conversation needs to keep going but the, I guess there would be a realization that there's many examples out there of when government actually can take that initiative and as it were without a necessarily there being a consensus think of unleaded petrol unleaded fuel a good example in our lifetimes unachievable um, people used to argue government took the initiative and actually we live in a very a very much safer place you think about health and safety legislation you think about these same uh, mining companies, of course, who to a very large extent have recognised that you know the penny has dropped, that the carbon implications of not just what they dig out the ground, but also when it's used for manufacturing at the other end, all of this is part and parcel of something they take responsibility for. So the world is moving in this direction where you can't clearly say whether it's government regulation and pop, uh, legislation on one side or it's public attitudes. It's a bit of both, actually, and I suspect that's probably what we're dealing with here. And after all, this was a session that dealt with an affordable zero waste mine strategy. The emphasis being on the A, affordable. Affordable to whom? The mine owners, the users of mine, mining products, or the public who will deal more generally with the, uh, the environmental consequences of that. So that's, I think, a really pertinent thing to keep going in the conversation. Look, can I just first of all thank uh, Nicole for her moderation uh, of this debate. It was very, very useful and very timely. Thank, thank you, Nicole. Can I also thank Ian, Mike and Felicia for their contributions. And I said at the beginning, particularly for Talitha, who you know was keen to push this and we've been delighted to partner with her. Can I also thank the Public Policy Institute team, Annika, Anna and Tam, who are sort of um, off screen, but in the background, they put together uh, this event um, seamlessly. And can I also shamelessly plug some future Public Policy Institute uh, upcoming events. Uh, three come to mind. Um, the uh, uh, first part of July, on the 2nd of July, we'll be dealing with uh, the data revolution in schools, or as we say in Australia, the data revolution in schools. Uh, and we'll be partnering with Glenn Savage and others from the School of Education at UWA. Um, in at the very end of July, on the 30th, we'll be partnering with Engineers Australia to deal with a session dealing uh, concerned with climate change and the challenges for the engineering profession, uh, professions getting ready for the kinds of things that they will be expected to do in an era of rapid uh, climate change challenges. 
And then in the early part of August, we'll be having a public event dealing with the um, international impacts of the COVID uh, public health crisis uh, in India, Indonesia and South Africa, partnering with several of our advisory board members. So this is just a range of things that we do. You can see they're quite eclectic. And in the background, there's a series of private events uh, which we tend to write up as well as part of our briefings. I won't keep you any longer. I thought that was a first class discussion. It's our great honor to partner with all of you in all of this. Uh, but I think it is, as I said, about keeping that conversation going. And this is a very useful first step in terms of ironing out who's got to do what, when will they do it, and how, to what extent is there kind of shared responsibility uh, to learn from good examples in the past when there's been tremendous innovation that has, uh, that has moved the needle. Uh, but with that, um, I, that's enough from me. Uh, can I just uh, thank everyone for uh, taking time out early on their Wednesday evening to be part of this discussion? Thank you.